Well, good evening and thanks for joining us tonight here on News 20 on GTN. We've got a great show for you tonight. We're going to talk with the American Cancer Society about Breast Cancer Awareness Month, the month of October here. And joining me to my right, as always, when we have the Cancer Society on April Zubek. Glad you could join us. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having us. And to your right, we have Sarah Bollinger, a Ph.D. candidate with Wash U and yes. uh, Breast Cancer Research. Glad you could join us also here on the show. Great. Thank you so much for having me. The one thing that we talked about before we went on the show is that, yes, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, when now it's almost a staple. When you see the color pink, you associate it with Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And the neat thing is that I think guys are very receptive to this now. With the coordinated effort with the NFL, you see all these guys wearing it. It's, it's like okay for a man to wear pink for that reason during this month. Yeah. How has that affected, in your mind's eye, the way guys see and perceive this and are able to talk openly with their wife or their mother or another female about this? I think it does. It helps them feel more comfortable talking with the people in their lives. And you know, you got to think that breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women besides skin cancer. And so many women are affected that most guys, you know, do have a woman in their life, whether it's a family member or a coworker who's been diagnosed and giving them that comfort level and letting them know the tagline is kind of real when real men wear pink, you know, it makes it okay and makes them feel, you know, a lot better when they're discussing it. I'm almost ashamed, but I have no pink on today. <laughs> I thought I had a pink tie here at the station when I came in, and I didn't. So I, I went with everywhere. the next shade, which is the light blue. So, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's prostate cancer. Awareness. Colon cancer. Colon cancer is the also light very blue. Very important. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, we'll talk about it, and we always do sometime during the year. But this is October. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. April, uh, before we talk to Sarah about uh, breast cancer research, um, talk to us about the cancer society as a whole, how you impact so many lives um, on a daily basis? Well, we do. And, you know, our most utilized service, which I'm sure people will see throughout the show, is our 1-800 number, where someone will answer the phone live 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, between that and the many free services that we provide to patients, we're a great resource for information, um, for help, you know, getting a ride to your treatment, getting a wig, getting mastectomy supplies because it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We can talk about that. We have a Hope Lodge in St. Louis and 31 across the country where people can stay for free for the duration of their treatment. And, you know, we have new statistics this year that we're really proud of, and that's that one out of every two women who's diagnosed with breast cancer reaches out to the American Cancer Society for help and support. So our reach is broad and we have a lot to offer. So if there's anyone out there who knows someone who's been diagnosed, please have them contact us because we have great resources to help. You hear about the numbers, you see the pink, you see all the campaigns, but until it really affects you, you don't think about how important that phone number is, how important that voice is on the other end of the phone. Your advice to somebody sitting out there that might be going through this about picking up that phone because that first call is always the hardest. It is, and what I have to tell you is the people who are going to answer the phone at the American Cancer Society talk to people in your shoes every single day, many people every single day around the clock, and if you've got a question you're afraid to ask, they've probably heard it before, so don't be afraid. And our specialists are trained in many different areas, so we actually have oncology nurses on staff there. We have people to help you with your health insurance. Um, we have staff that can help you navigate the, the different services that are available through the American Cancer Society or through other organizations if there's something that we don't provide. Um, questions about your treatment, we've got trained people and um, maybe you just don't even know what you want to ask. You just know you need someone to talk to. Just give them a call because we have a lot of people who do that. And we will put up the phone number and the website throughout the show here on News 20. Um, Sarah, let's bring Sarah into the conversation and help everybody understand that the driving force behind everything is research. The money's raised through all the things you guys do for research. And that's where you come in. Explain. That's right. It seems like almost a daunting task when you look at cancer as a whole. How does a researcher even play a part in breaking this all down? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, it's important to know that researchers don't work alone, that we work um, in teams and we have a, a history of science that builds over time. So we sort of just take the next step. Um, I work with a large team of people uh, at WashU. Um, my mentor, Dr. Sarah Gellert, sort of initiated the research that I'm doing, and I'm sort of taking the next step, um, building off of her work. Um, she did the same thing when she was in a similar position as, as I am now. So, um, you know, when you think about one individual researcher, it's hard to think that it would have any impact, but really um, we have teams of researchers working over generations, you know, years and years of time, and you know, slowly we chip away, and, and the ultimate goal is to find the cure, um, but it's one little step at a time. That was gonna be my next question. With so many different forms of cancer, and it being a daunting task, is it a frustrating type experience? Because I'm a very here and now. You know, you say something, you get a response. But with this, this could be years, a lifetime of research and work, and nothing may happen. It may be the next generation that solves a problem that you worked on your entire life. That's right. I mean, I could see how it would be frustrating at times, absolutely. Um, but even the small impacts that we make uh, really go a long way. You know, my research study is fairly small in terms of the scope, um, and yet, you know, I speak to women every day about their experience of having breast cancer being diagnosed. Um, and the impact on their lives is is really so important and even even that even reaching out you know touching those people's lives having sort of one on one contact with people who are experiencing it getting to add their voice to the mix it's so rewarding and um, though we might not find the cure today on this study um, hearing those rewarding stories, um, getting to sort of add that information to our collection, um, you know, that is inspiring for me, so. When you look at a whole, not only in this country, but across the world, people doing research on this, is there a quantitative number that you could maybe put on it? I mean, mm -hmm. is it a thousand? Is it a hundred thousand? That is a good question. I'm actually not sure. You'd have to look at, you know, all of the universities across the United States that have breast cancer programs. You know, I'm sure the American Cancer Society keeps track of uh, the researchers that they fund on cancer.org. They would have some information about um, the number that they fund. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> it's a good question. Is there um, a personal connection into why you got involved in this? I mean, what mm -hmm. gets you out of bed every day to go and do this research? Mm -hmm for so many other people. Yeah, there are a couple of reasons that I started um, looking into this research. Um, I was a hospice social worker before I went back for my PhD doing clinical work with people who had cancer. And um, I was working a lot with young women who had very aggressive breast cancer. And so it just sort of sparked my interest. I made some really good friendships and relationships with my patients, inspired me. Um, and, and also, while I was doing this work, my husband was diagnosed with cancer at a very, very young age. Age. And um, so I had a, a personal experience of cancer. It wasn't breast cancer, obviously, but um, although men do suffer from breast cancer as well, uh, but I was experiencing, you know, cancer in a young person in my life while also working with all of these patients, uh, young women, uh, young men who had various kinds of cancer. And I just kind of wanted to get to the bottom of what was going on. Um, why is this? You know, what what was what was the cause and, and how do we understand this. Um, so, so yeah, it was definitely a, a personal uh, thing that sort of sparked my interest and then as I got into the data and started reading, um, there was so much interesting information about kind of how the social environment actually impacts cancer outcomes and my brain started working. <laughs> brain started, the wheels started clicking. <laughs> April, everybody such as Sarah has a story somewhere along the family lines or we'll have a story along the family lines. Um, how much of an emotional impact does it have on you on an everyday basis dealing you know, with families and people and out talking to people who are facing these situations? Yeah, it's, it's difficult, it's hard because um, you hear, you feel the emotion, you hear the emotion in their voice when you talk to them and they just need help and a lot of times they're also searching for some hope and we have great staff especially you know our staff who are working out in the hospitals in the waiting rooms they're talking to the patients and to the caregivers 
right there while they're waiting for their doctor appointment to make sure that they can be um, a shoulder for them, an ear for them, and then to let them know, you know, we're here and what we can do to help you. Because it is hard. It's like we said earlier, when it hits you close to home that it's you or your loved one, it's not just the word cancer anymore. It, it really has a huge meaning. When you look nationally at how money is raised and how it is raised locally, walk us through the funding. I know there was a big concert and stuff with that stand up to cancer type um, event that raised a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And then there's local events that raise a lot of money. How is the money funneled? And if you're here in St. Louis per se, how do you know if you want to donate to keep your money here in the area that it will stay? Is there certain places and ways you can do that? Well, with the American Cancer Society, you know, we're very fortunate. We have events like Relay for Life, which we've talked a lot about on the show, Making Strides Against Breast Cancer, which is at the end of this month, um, things with Coaches versus Cancer. And the money that we raise here um, ultimately funds our mission, which would be the free services that we provide, the information and education that we provide on early detection, prevention, and then your treatment options, all of that. Um, all of, all of, also our advocacy efforts, so working with our um, legislators on making sure that patient rights are protected and research. And just to give you some perspective, um, the researchers that we have at Washington University and St. Louis University, there is more money being funded just in research alone, which is one piece of our mission in St. Louis, than we're raising in St. Louis. So we're, we're very, very fortunate to have these great institutions that we get to work with and partner with. There's a lot of money being spent in St. Louis to help patients and to help find a cure. This is, when we talk about it being a St. Louis issue or a worldwide issue, it's bigger than St. Louis. So when that money goes in, it's going to research all over the country. You look at Wash U and St. Louis University, though, they're right there at the top of the, of the heap of research. Um, when you were trying to decide where to go, what to do, how to follow up your education, what were some of the reasons to go, one, to Wash U and stay here in St. Louis? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was coming from New York University um, after my master's degree, and I applied to PhD programs all over the country um, and had many great offers, really. Um, but ultimately, Wash U was my first choice and, and the school that I decided on um, because exactly that, because they're very well funded in terms of research, they're very well supported. Um, Siteman Cancer Center is one of the top in the nation. Um, and then, uh, again, you know, my mentor was here in St. Louis. Uh, the work that she was doing was sort of unprecedented. Um, and it was just the best opportunity in order to have access to the most resources and also have the experience that I wanted to have, you know, have the most impact. So, yeah.